Ja, meine Damen, meine Herren. Ladies, Gentlemen, Guests. I am uh, extremely uh, impressed by your stamina. Uh, we've had uh, lots of very exciting uh, panels. Yeah? And now I have uh, uh, the uh, pleasure to be the moderator of our final panel. I'm very much looking forward to that. I uh, hope that we'll be able to bring things together here. Uh, the, the Stefan Meyer and Georg Schmidt are not available today, but we have been able to uh, um, deliver the info as regards what uh, plans are on the way for Africa. We basically talked uh, about uh, uh, the, the the plans of the government, German government, not so much of EU, but also Japan, China, whatever. they're all on their way to Africa, are already there. We had a very intensive discussion uh, across the entire meeting, which uh, infrastructure, which investment does Africa actually need? And we had a very critical take on the major uh, uh, um, infrastructure projects which are in the pipeline driven by major banks. And in the last panel, we had a very impressive uh, uh, go on the various different perspectives from various different African countries and heard what a investment would uh, Africa really need? And it was little uh, talk about investment from abroad, but rather uh, there are excellent uh, ideas as to how this investment should look like. That may be also for the panelists as the context of uh, this panel. The strong message of the last panel was I never ever uh, doubted that. Africa it definitely needs in, uh, infrastructure. Everybody uh, uh, underlines uh, uh, that. But the question is, which and how will the funding be arranged for that? And, um, and there was that strong uh, message across all country examples. Uh, uh, we need investment specifically here for small and medium-sized companies. Uh, for an infrastructure which creates jobs, and this can't be expected through major infrastructure projects, but rather small ones. And what uh, was highlighted by all three panelists of the last panel was that it is important to build infrastructure for the rural population, which needs access to markets. That was a strong message. Now, we will come back to these uh, subject matters during the course of the panel. I wanted to repeat what I said in my uh, uh, opening speech yesterday evening. It is for us about the critical view on the diverse plans, on the Compact for Africa, uh, with Africa, uh, Marshall Plan, etc., the plans of the ministries. I would like to briefly introduce to you the uh, guests, uh, but only very briefly because we want to have much time for the discussion. We have uh, a change in the program. To my very left, uh, we have uh, Uwe Kekerich again. He is development policy spokesperson of Bündnis 90 Die Grünen. And he uh, replaced Friedrich Schmidt, the uh, deputy whip of the Green uh, Party faction. Friedrich Schmidt is unfortunately not able to come because now and in parallel there is a motion uh, heard uh, of the Green Party on G20. So thank you, Uwe, that you are available um, uh, for uh, this second uh, stance here today and that you and to my very right, we have Georg Schmidt, a sub-Saharan uh, officer or uh, a spokesperson of the Foreign Office. Uh, I'm very keen to learn more about uh, the views of the Foreign uh, Department here. 
thanks for being here. And I would like to welcome Stefan Meyer. He is member of uh, the board um, of the Federal Association of German Industry. Uh, uh, VDI is wearing the hat uh, at the B20, the business community organization task, so to speak, from all the 19 countries uh, which are members of G10. So wonderful to see also you here, Dr. Stefan Meyer. Uh, who was not announced was uh, Elizabeth Siviropoulos. Uh, our surprise guest. Uh, because we thought, oh, we do just that. Uh, um, we have all these white people here on the panel. But you are a white South African. Uh, you are head of the South African Institute of International Affairs in Joburg. And uh, you're very much uh, 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 accustomed to the G20 process. Uh, South Africa is uh, um, the only African country in the G20. And I promise you there will be time. We'll make sure. Uh, that you will have time for questions from the audience. Um, we want to continue our guests from Cameroon, Senegal, Nigeria, etc., uh, that they have an opportunity to raise their questions or uh, direct their comments vis-à-vis uh, -vis the members of the panel. My income, uh, my uh, introductory question goes to all of you, and I ask them to all be brief. Uh, on the background of the Africa year, how do you assess the initiatives of the federal government of the, and what uh, chances do you see for these Marshall plans and and uh, compact with Africa? I would like to start with you, Mr. Schmidt. And now. How I like the initiatives of the federal government uh, uh, as a member of the uh, government is a nice introduction. Uh, three years ago, we had these Africa policy guidelines passed by the cabinet three years ago. So that was a document which is uh, coordinated between the various different ministries. It's, it's, uh, it's long. My British colleague once said, Now we have 16 uh, um, uh, uh, <laughs> goals, I would have said now. Uh, it uh, is uh, worth why looking at these guidelines time and again. It's not, uh, not so much received or covered by the press, um, but what we've seen uh, uh, reflected by others. As somebody who's been dealing with African policy, and there's others that have uh, done that for a longer period of time, so it was uh, good to see that also other uh, ministries have um, intensively dealt with Africa, and this used to be the case because in the past, uh, uh, African policy was, of course, routine business, but uh, the uh, BMZ was doing. Uh, 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 but if I have the research ministry and other ministries, Ministry of the Economy was not so much involved. And if these ministries all say, yes, well, let's, let's uh, look at these goals and develop them. And, uh, and now we've been dealing with, uh, for two years with this and asking, yes, we want to achieve things and what's the uh, goals of the partners of ours, etc. Um, and of course, in Asia and in India, we also have the ministries which are on the way. And China is the same. And we're also uh, happy that other uh, ministries are also active uh, as regards Africa. So the success indicator is that others have uh, um, used your guidelines as well. Yes, I'm very happy about that. 
other ministries, that is. And if now the finance minister is now looking at this in a more structured way, why is so much capital underways and why does so little capital go to sub-Saharan Africa, then this can provide for a new and a fresh perspective. Sometimes it's very technical. I don't know how much Mr. Schuhknecht talked about this. Sometimes it's not uh, big money that needs to be moved, but rather that just conditions need to be changed in these countries, but also in Germany. And that's the question that the compact uh, raises. What has to be done in terms of reforms in those countries and also in Germany? And then put this in a G20 context is an, is a feat. Just look at uh, Mexico, Argentina. They have completely different uh, concerns than Africa currently has. So that uh, uh, provides an opportunity to talk about other things. So mu how much capital uh, uh, is uh, drained from Africa? And G20 is finance. So you can also tackle this. Uh, in, uh, 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 in a larger scale, uh, in how far this is going to be uh, successful remains to be seen. It's a new uh, initiative, what came of NIPAP. Uh, I don't think that we have a magic wand here and then everything is changing. There will be a backfiring here and we have to check what's going to happen on the European level. Nonetheless, it's a positive step. If I look at uh, the B, um, uh, uh, the, the Ministry of the Economy, uh, they take this more seriously now. If we want to promote uh, foreign investment differently, then this is also reflected in the guidelines, by the way, and what's uh, reflected in the ideas of uh, uh, Mr. Muller. There's lots of uh, conditionality, and African parties don't like to hear this. There's a lot about uh, opening up the economy, um, and uh, at last it's a statement uh, that says humanitarian aid and development cooperation are important, but they alone will not wash, will, will not help uh, developing above certain levels. And to be brief, there's lots of potential. And I feel encouraged uh, that we'll have the uh, uh, first German-African uh, Business Summit in Nairobi, supported by the various different ministries, So, uh, and look at Africa in a more diversified manner. I said the uh, uh, question goes to all. How does the BDI look at all these beautiful plants? We'll just start with a positive thing. All three um, plants have one thing in common. They uh, focus on job opportunities and put private economy uh, center stage for uh, economic development. Uh, but these uh, plans are on a different uh, level in terms of abstraction. Very critical, I see the Marshall Plan. I don't think that Africa needs a development plan. MEPAD was uh, mentioned. Uh, um, I looked at it when I did other things like BDA, and the results were very poor. Africa does not need over-ambitious uh, development plans, which uh, instill wrong uh, uh, expectation functioning, uh, uh, tax offices, port authorities, also all that is necessary, and that's what we should uh, focus on. So. Marshall Plan develops uh, d is on a macro level, which is not of interest to me. Initiative Pro uh, Africa is on a micro level. That's uh, certain um, uh, support mechanisms are discussed and improved. I can live with this. Uh, the compact with Africa is interesting because I believe it addresses the right level. Uh, mid-level macroeconomic stability, where it's about conditions for uh, corporations, for businesses, uh, financial uh, conditions. It is also interesting because it is based on a study uh, um, um, developed by the IMF, the uh, from African American Bank, etc. So it is a different genesis to this plan. That's why we from the BDI would look much at the compact with Africa and also be committed to this during the conference that is organized and stay to the plan. Some things are very reasonable in this plan. 
financial transfers out of Africa <coughs> are uh, um, problematized here. And, uh, uh, so at a first glance, I believe that is the uh, plan that's most interesting. Would you have to see how the commitment of the other G20 countries will be and how the commitment of the compact countries in Africa will be. We hear the hint. Uh, we use this stuff in order to do what we um, want to do anyways and get maybe some additional funding here and there. But uh, be it as it may, the most interesting of this rate plans is to compact with Africa. Stefan Meyer differentiated with um, uh, regards the diverse flint. Uh, yeah, please remove all these smartphones. Um, so from your perspective, uh, along the various different plans. What's uh, worth criticizing from the point of view of the Green Party? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. First, I think there is something positive about all three plans. They are publicly discussed, so this is a precondition to deal with it. Well, basically speaking, I think Africa needs a lot, but it doesn't need new plans. Plans have been developed for 60 years. They are available. Uh, let's look at these plans, like the Marshall Plan, which you appreciated. I wonder what is new about this Marshall Plan. You won't find a single passage that is new. There are plans, also African plans. The issue is the implementation, and when I have an implementation problem, I cannot tackle it by a new plan. This is the weak point. The international politicians, international politicians do not analyze the problem. What do they do? They uh, make media relevant plans like Marshall Plan. Could you think of anything more gigantic? Marshall Plan is the biggest that ever existed. So the uh, uh, name is wrong, but Mr. Schmidt has smugly. Uh, sorry, we can't hear what is being said if no mic is being used. Uh, well, take it along. I do not n need my mobile anymore. So I just uh, mentioned Mr. Schmidt, who smugly uh, quoted the Africa strategy of the foreign ministry, and uh, Miller also presented an Africa paper and his Africa strategy. And he didn't coordinate it. This is a problem we have had with the Ministry for Development. The uh, minister doesn't communicate uh, things in the cabinet. So I wonder how can we have a coherent development policy if the ministries do not talk to each other? I can't accept it. And I'm also a bit critical, Mr. Schmidt, when you say now the the Ministry of the, uh, for the Environment has always been involved. The Ministry for Agriculture is now also playing a part. The Finance Ministry. I wonder in how far is it coordinated coherently, and I can tell you this is not the case. We have been criticizing the efficiency of development policies. And we know one reason is that there is no 
coherence between our ministries. And the other question is, what about the coordination at the European level or and the coordination with our partners? In uh, no case, the African countries were really involved. We now have a fixed plan. We say, well, Dear Africans, we have a compact here, and if you want to, you can join. This is not what I would expect as to the pro-Africa issue. Well, Africa needs a lot, but it doesn't need any subsidies for German exports or German industry. This is not necessary in whatever form. And I do not understand the whole concept. Another flaw is that the LDCs are not considered, but it is more about middle income countries where there is a market. So when you invest as an entrepreneur, you want to make uh, profits. This is correct. But is it the task for us to enhance this development? I think we should also focus on the uh, most vulnerable on the continent. Well, what else? It was said when we invest, there need to be different criteria, social, environmental criteria. So generally, all the investments have to be measured against the SDG, but also against the results of the Addis Conference. And I do not see a clear reference. Mr. Schuknecht said, of course, the compact is oriented toward the SDGs because it creates jobs, infrastructure, and uh, they ensure sustainability. Such an argument shows that uh, there has not been a clear analysis of SDGs. It's also about social issues, how to promote the common good. Thank you. I think we will come back to the details later. Now to Elizabeth. How, what is your take? What would you criticize or what do you see as positive with regard to the plans? Um, I think uh, some of the points that have uh, uh, been made uh, would reflect uh, views from, from the continent about both some of the positive, di positive dimensions of, of these various plans as well as the a critique of them. I think it's important to make the point that on many levels, this is really about engaging uh, African countries, not through a development aid prism entirely, but looking at it also from a business perspective. So we know that uh, trade is, is very important and much better than aid. We know that being able to create productive economies, uh, which allow us, as we heard in the in the earlier session, for uh, to to develop a, a domestic tax base, is actually a far more sustainable approach than. Um, uh, than having to rely on, on, on inflows. And yes, there is this difference between LDCs and, uh, and, and middle-income countries. And, and clearly, and again, it came out in the previous session, the, the needs and the way in which one engages with middle-income countries is obviously going to be uh, uh, different from low-income countries. Um, so in, in, in some respects, uh, you know, they tick, they tick some of the boxes. The, you know, there is reference in, in the Marshall Plan to sustainability, to socioeconomic, they, they talk about investment. Um, there is also importantly talk about, uh, you know, governance, uh, good governance and human rights, which takes us back to the early NEPAD uh, discussions of the early 2000s. Both Stefan and I were <laughs> uh, re remember those well. Uh, and those are important dimensions, and those are things that uh, that African states have have, uh, have taken on themselves. And I want to come back to that in terms of Agenda 2063. But if I think of, um, if, you know, if I if I try to uh, identify a, a tweetable uh, uh, set of concepts <laughs> uh, around these, uh, I would call them the three C's, and it would be consultation, 
coordination and conditionality. Uh, consultation, I think, uh, uh, certainly in the context of the Marshall Plan, uh, reflecting some of the debates we'd had in, De uh, in Johannesburg earlier this year uh, when we hosted together with the German Development Institute the uh, T20 Africa, mm -hmm. the first T20 Africa, it was very clear that the degree of consultation before the Marshall Plan, an unfortunate name, although very uh, you know, very resonating in, in Germany, but not so much in, in Africa. W before it was uh, announced, there hadn't really been much uh, uh, consultation, and, and I think that's an issue. And consultation not only with Africa, but I would argue consultation across ministries, and that takes us to the second C, which is around coordination. I have to say that in February, um, I was very confused about Marshall Plan Compact for Africa in particular. I wasn't quite sure what, I've subsequently discovered, <laughs> uh, learnt a little bit more about it, but I think that's, that's an important point. Um, and the, the third issue is, is around conditionality. There are dimensions in both, I would argue, and I'm here, I'm, I, I want to speak specifically about those two, Marshall Plan and, and, and Compact. There are dimensions there that are reminiscent of a kind of, you know, if you do this, then we'll do that in a way that I think uh, many African countries have really had to had experience for a long time and, and are trying to move away from. I think there is a genuine desire uh, among many quarters, uh, but, uh, and I would argue that you know, civil society clearly, but also uh, among governments of the importance of, 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 of dimensions of good governance, if not all of them, in, 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 in some cases. And, um, and, and we know that those are sustainable if they are really driven from inside. Uh, and that uh, external engagement on a lot of these issues, I think, has done a lot to help broaden the civil society uh, dimensions in, in African societies. But we don't always tackle the political economy that drives non-implementation of policies that actually make make a lot of sense. Um, so let me come to Agenda 2063 and... Please explain yeah. it to those Right, who don't know. yes. So Agenda 2063 uh, is uh, the African Union's plan. It was adopted in the uh, by the African Union in... Uh, in 2013, it's supposed to be a 50-year time horizon. As I like to say, I'm probably not going to be around when uh, we reach uh, <laughs> the deadline, uh, but it is broken down into, into manageable chunks of 10 years each. There is now a 10-year implementation plan, and they've identified seven key aspirations, which really touch on a, on, on a whole range of issues, from uh, inclusive growth and sustainable development uh, uh, to, to bringing peace to the continent. And they'd like, uh, the AU has set a target of 2020, which I think is a little ambitious, but nevertheless, uh, it's good to focus the mind, uh, to issues of good governance and democracy. And very, very importantly, uh, and it's aspiration number seven, increasing uh, and creating a, a platform for African voices on global issues. So it's about bringing Africa's voice into the global uh, domain, not sort of having it as a, a side discussion uh, when we talk about development or when we talk about a particular narrative that dominates, I think, the discussion on Africa and to some extent underpins uh, some of the thinking, I think, in the, in the Marshall Plan, which is about needing to respond to some of the security and migration uh, challenges that have faced Europe in the last, uh, in, in the last couple of years. And this is, in fact, the plan that has been adopted and which we are now trying to, uh, to implement. And I think when we talk about engagement with external partners, it's not whether external partners have their own Marshall plans or the equivalent, but the extent to which partnerships can be developed saying, well, you know, you've got this pillar here, uh, whether it's around uh, enabling environment for FDI or its issues around customs or taxation, and we can actually work together to help build up uh, 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 that, that priority that you've identified. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, comprehensive crit critique and recommendation as well. Bleiben wir doch wirklich noch mal beim But let's stick with how these plans have come about. In the last panel, I heard stop your paternalistic approach to Africa. This time is over. Stop and listen what we want to see, what our think tanks or our civil societies have 
to offer. So a double question to you, Mr. Schmidt. One question is, why wasn't the uh, AU Agenda 2063 the starting point for the negotiations? How come that each individual German ministry developed their own plan? Uh, do they want to be especially important or invent big names? I know that you are a diplomat, but I would like to get your take on this. The second question takes up what Elizabeth has said and what we also heard from Mr. Schuhknecht. The central issue is the massive fragmentation of the different plans Africa has to deal with, not only the German ones, how this fragmentation can be overcome. And the question here is, how is the foreign office involved in the coordination, not only within Germany, but within the EU and the G20? Well, it's quite a lot I put on your plate. Some contradictions I cannot explain. When you look at the BMZ, it says it, um, it is called Marshall Plan, and at the same time it says it's food for thought. So I cannot explain this. You have to ask this question to somebody else. That it uh, evoked different associations. Well, one was perhaps, well, now the uh, Germans come and build up everything and they will lavish funds on us. But at least we are still talking about it during the last three years. There were different concepts, and this has been discussed in Germany, and also the uh, AU President Faki mentioned it in Strasbourg as a Marshall Plan for Africa, while Minister Müller always underlines with Africa. And this brings me to the Agenda 2063. The document refers to the targets. The Agenda 2063 is interesting. It's far away, enough far away, so that it will not touch us. And I do not read in the agenda how you get there. The paradise will come up after a long period, but it requires difficult political decisions, trade-offs. So. I, I hesitate. I mean, it's good to relate to Agenda 2063, but in discussions, I often hear quite different statements. Well, my second point to talk to Africa, I'm responsible for sub-Saharan Africa. And sometimes it's quite tiresome. Uh, to do things. I mean, South Africa is quite different, or how can I uh, compare uh, Mauritius and uh, Cap Verden? I find it much more interesting to discuss individual countries, what is going on in Cameroon, what is happening here or there. And you also asked the question of coordination. We have different departments which are highly independent, but we meet, try to coordinate things, especially when there is a trade-off, then it gets interesting. So for instance, how to handle countries who have uh, achieved high development indicators but problems with democracy and human rights. What I find interesting that is that it's now no longer an either or discussion. And we do not say any longer there are 
uh, massive globalization forces and on the African uh, continent, many uh, do not know how to cope with it. No, I mean, we say we want to change things. We want to change mentalities. I'm not a big planner. James Jequati yesterday said in a discussion round, if there was an MDG for uh, mobile phones, we would have over fulfilled it because the uh, forces were there. We often focus on things that do not work from our perspective instead of looking what is working. My third point, and this is also a core task of the Foreign Office, Peace and security, we can say a lot about development cooperation when the people are afraid leave their fields because of war, then the best roads are of no use. And the document also says leave no one behind. But what does it mean? So I think it's very essential also to focus on peace and security, uh, looking at conflict analysis, policing, mediation. And if there is no other way, even military measures, so that we look at the whole spectrum and also uh, take up the AU by their words to support them that they can do it themselves. But what is interesting about the G20 compact is that it is focused on the economy and growth, not on political stability. How do we promote crisis pre prevention? Allow me one more sentence, and then you get the floor. Because it cannot be the overall concept. In Germany, we tend to think we need one piece of art uh, that covers all uh, aspect. Yeah, but coherence is also nice. Yeah, it is nice. But if uh, uh, the uh, the uh, foreign office would deal with uh, other uh, areas uh, difficult, or the uh, e economic ministry. Well, it is a s selected companies. It is mutual. If there's partners that say we commit to do this and that, well, uh, I mentioned NEPAD and others. So you, you have to see what's the bottom line. But at least it is a try to say let's do things differently. For many countries, it will not be relevant or for a foreseeable future relevant. It's not the magic wand that will change everything overnight. Mr. Schuknecht uh, said or answered um, on the question, isn't the economy too much uh, in the focus? Um, uh, and he answered, well, uh, the Federal Finance Ministry policy is is what we want to do is 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 neutral, and many uh, felt a certain itch. You know, there is a, a corporate corp, uh, the the, the uh, responsible of German uh, of corporate Germany regarding Africa. What's uh, the uh, response? Uh, the responsibility um, uh, of German industry if it uh, deals with Africa. Uh, the plans are not based on development aid, but rather um, supporting c positive conditions for the economy, for business, then uh, is the, there is the question. Uh, the German economy is then asked to do more in Africa. Uh, is that message uh, received at companies organized at your BDE? Maybe a nice quote from our uh, development aid minister Müller, who says, "Look, we have 400,000 German companies. Only 800 are active in Germany, uh, in Africa, and with my Marshall Plan, I want that uh, there will be at least 5,000 companies, uh, German ac companies, active in Africa. Will that be 5,000 um, uh, companies active in?" Uh, Africa soon because the conditions are better. 
Yes, I come back to that question, but I have to also comment on the compact of, uh, with Africa. G20 had a mandate for um, uh, finance and economy coordination, not for peace and security. Yeah, uh, so you have to stick to the mandate of the G20. We are criticizing uh, G20 quite rightly because they are um, interfering with just about everything. No, uh, this is uh, a standpoint after the necessity after the economic crisis to have. Uh, economic cooperation. That's why this compact with Africa is in line with this mandate or focus. But now on the companies. Uh, of course, companies uh, will not invest because the um, uh, uh, minister of the uh, economic cooperation tells them so. No, they look what's meaningful. Companies have invested a lot uh, over the last 10 years. The market is dynamically enough so that it is interesting, and then you are uh, uh, um, prepared to, to take risks. China is a good example uh, with regards to good governance and other issues. So we have sufficient issues with China. Nonetheless, it attracted uh, sufficient investment because the market was big and uh, it was attractive in us also to take these risks. If that is not. Um, maybe you think maybe uh, invest in other countries because they fit your supply chain well. And then we have then physical security right down to legal security, uh, corruption. How much can you rely that your import and export licenses that you hold are then uh, also uh, transactionable? Uh, that you can uh, uh, enforce uh, 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 contracts with uh, suppliers. Security, uh, of course, can you get your product to the port and out of the country? That plays an important role. And then uh, competitive um, uh, labor force. Uh, it, uh, well, uh, there is an impression that Germany invests where there is cheap labor. And if you look at German companies and German industry, this is not normal. Siemens is uh, setting up uh, a production site uh, the way it sets up production sites in Germany. So you need minimum uh, skill levels of the workforce that is essential for investment. And in most countries in Africa, there's still a lot to be done. Good investment, bad investment. What investment is needed? This was another question. Every company would need to say would would say uh, well investment must be sustainable. I think uh, if we do uh, foreign uh, business funding based on taxpayers' money, uh, it is fair to say we define the high standards, meaning uh, what we want to have in order to um, uh, greenlight these monies. We have a textile alliance and. Uh, we have also uh, we have accepted in terms of SDGs a lot what's been defined uh, in terms of standard. We are uh, insisting at the World Bank that sustainability becomes a, a central criteria for awarding World Bank monies. Uh, if there is no state money, um, then it was about the guest uh, country to define the criteria then these African countries would need to define what investment they want and what uh, am I prepared to, uh, to, to, to accept and what's not. Uh, well, we can discuss, uh, well, uh, um, that uh, uh, African government is not represented by the population, but that's a different matter. But it is about the African society to, to define what investment it wants. That was a decision, a uh, distinction that I want to make. Yeah, well, that is exactly what we're trying to do with this conference, to give an answer to the question, what's investment that African countries need? And uh, you have to look at the state of development and the infrastructure situation, of course. It was clearly stated uh, by our African uh, uh, representatives here that it is important uh, to have investment into basic infrastructure. And here we had this uh, uh, plea from Nigeria. These big projects 
that are in the planning uh, are implemented in five years' time or in eight years' time, but uh, we need now uh, jobs for the young population, which uh, is looking for a perspective, uh, for a future perspective. Therefore, is the question there? We as Germany, can we become active in this uh, field? And that brings us to back to the question, which is the red thread through this meeting. This compact, these plans are counting much, uh, very strongly on public-private partnership. And, and to be clear, it's public money taxpayers' money from the development aid budget are combined with private money. Uh, and, and then, then there is that hope that uh, political risks are covered, and then you have uh, Hermes and other uh, uh, foreign uh, trade uh, promotion. And that's the public part. And then with this security in the back, to bring the private economy uh, to invest even when the conditions are difficult. And these uh, uh, triple P initiatives, there has always been a critical debate. And now a question to Uwe Kekeritz. Is this the right answer? Or shouldn't we use uh, uh, taxpayers' money for uh, supporting public goods only? And why now PPP? Is that a good way? When we looked at the uh, these plans. Uh, it's always PPP as the leverage to mobilize money for African countries. We've had a lot of uh, uh, experience with uh, uh, Triple P in, in, in also in Germany. And the auditor's uh, court has been very critical. And also in Germany, it's a catastrophe. It's expensive for the uh, population. It's bad for the infrastructure. And it is moving debt into the future. Debt is there, but it is just not posted uh, uh, in the annual account but forwarded, and this is extremely negative. We know that for the uh, uh, tolls for the highways in France, they have a return on, on uh, investment of 9 to 12 percent, these operators of these uh, highways in, in France. Uh, and that makes these projects so expensive, and there's no investor in, in and if they uh, do calculate 10% return uh, for a start, difficult. So and there has to be also private uh, lending. And also these, uh, this lending is more expensive. So we tr do two things, three, three things. We make these projects more expensive. We guarantee companies a high profit, and and drive nations into indebtedness. Just look at the 80s, uh, the debt crisis in almost in all in all developing and threshold countries. There had to be structural adjustment programs and measures, i.e in the social uh, area, in the educational area, etc., there was massive cuts, meaning the uh, population paid the foot of the bill in these developing and threshold countries. And that is uh, nonsensical also economically. I'm not for uh, water supply, health care delivery, and other areas which are important for the general population, that they are in private hands. We have our European history. How long have we fought for state-controlled, public-controlled uh, uh, supplies? Uh, should it work differently in Africa? I, I lack uh, uh, imagination. 
Uh, of course, uh, you can then say, oh, these governments are corrupt. We have to do pu uh, public private. And, uh, and the government will always be on board because it's PPP. It's public private. So it will not work through PPP if the government doesn't deliver uh, also. So the idea behind all of this is to bring as many corporations to Africa as possible. And of course, if if uh, if high profit is guaranteed mid long term, then many investors will come. They'll say, "Okay, my risk is so low, so let's let's get going." Uh, and that is then ten, fifteen years. And if it all goes downhill, then they just simply say farewell, and the debt remains with that government, to that state. Stefan Meyer. Uh, is there this is that tempting for German companies? Is that an incentive? Is it attractive? In none of our papers, it's a priority. The basic idea is the following: mobilize private capital for public services. Of course, there's also a critical view of the uh, auditor's code in Germany. And it has uh, also to do with the design of these of these projects. Um, what state can do? What a private economy can do? Uh, you have to differentiate by sector. We mentioned the mobile phone. It was basically private uh, investment, and it has solved the problem in Africa and. Uh, if you try to do fixed net in Africa, know uh, what uh, improvement the mobile phone was. And that was private money, basically, that brought about this infrastructure. Through decentralized local infrastructure problem, we can do a lot, and it is, is, is surely in the area of renewable energies. However, we will not do without major projects like a uh, railway from Nairobi to Kampala or what have you. Uh, it, rema it remains a major project and will play a central role for the economic development of that region. Uh, so you have to uh, uh, really uh, uh, ask what infrastructure project are we talking about? What's feasible? What's meaningful? On these high uh, uh, returns, I know of no public uh, uh, taxpayer-based uh, um, project that guarantees this return. It is about exposure uh, minimization, uh, export credit uh, assurance or, or investment protection uh, 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 agreement. It's about risk mitigation. And none uh, in the government would say, or in the federal uh, 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 economic ministry, would uh, uh, accept financing a, a return of 10%. And, and none of our companies that are co engaged here would uh, withdraw after 10, 15 years. On the contrary, it's long term. We are there for the long term. South Africa is a good example, and other countries as well, where countries, uh, companies have invested over decades. The Germans are not the first to invest, but when they invest it, uh, then they stay. It's not just some that uh, hit and run, like 10, 15 years of profit maximization. Elizabeth, to you the question. Do you think PPP are attractive? I mean, my question is, it could be a good model if the public sector says, yes, we would like to have a combination of public and private, if it helps to develop the basic infrastructure. But what we see is that PPP often identifies bankable large-scale projects. So we have to look at the target and how can we reach it. Uh, basic health, basic infrastructure, also in the rural sector. How can this be funded? We need answers to this. This is what I also heard in the previous panel, how the large population can benefit. I think the first point uh, to make about uh, 
uh, some of the uh, broader infrastructure uh, needs on, on, on the continent um, is that when we talk about infrastructure, I'd like to talk about it in two ways. There's both the hard infrastructure, <coughs> and this is a, a lot of uh, the discussion uh, has been dominated over the last couple of years on <coughs> some of the major uh, infrastructure, hard infrastructure. And then there's the soft infrastructure. Some of the soft infrastructure includes the ability, the, the, the social delivery uh, uh, dimension. But it also fundamentally is about what we also heard in the previous panel, about education, uh, which, is, which is the bedrock of any uh, attempt to create a, a more productive economy. So I think, I think it, that's just the first point in terms of investments and, and infrastructure that I think is important. The second one is that if we look at the Sustainable Development Goals um, and uh, the, the astronomical figures that uh, have been uh, calculated in terms of how, you, um, how we will achieve them over the next 15 years, clearly, uh, uh, certainly for, for developing economies, the, the aid budgets are, are just not, um, not sufficient. So we need to look to other sources. Some of them, of course, are, are very much about what has dominated the debate in Africa is how do we uh, uh, create domestic sources of mobilization, how do we maximize um, capital markets, and some of that discussion was also uh, noted by uh, Carlos Lopes uh, last, last night. And then there is the, the role of the private sector, and we've seen that certainly dominate many of the development debates uh, about, you know, this is the panacea. I don't think it's the panacea, not on its own, but I think it is an important, it's an important player. And I think the points that Stefan made about certain sectors where it actually works better than, than others and it actually ends up creating much more uh, uh, value add uh, you know, and, and mobile telephony, I think, is, is probably the, the best example of that, I think is, 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 is an important uh, case. The problem is with some of the more traditional major infrastructure uh, uh, projects um, where, uh, well, firstly, there are a couple of points here. The highly complex nature of uh, the legal dimension of public-private partnerships, and we've had that uh, come up repeatedly over many years, and the need, uh, and some countries have it and others don't, and so the, important, uh, uh, um, uh, the importance of developing uh, or having uh, partnerships, uh, and here the African Development Bank has tried to do some of that, where you're providing certain legal skills to be able to to negotiate them effectively, so that you actually don't have a situ, you know, so that you you to the extent that you possibly can, <laughs> uh, you cover you cross all your T's and you dot all your uh, all your I's. I don't know what that would be in German, but <laughs> um, uh, so I think that's that that's that's important. Uh, so I wouldn't take a. A, a, a sort of an overall uh, position that says public-private is bad, period. But I think it needs to be unpacked at, at various sectoral levels and, and recognizing where it might actually add value. Let me give you an example on social issues. And this is a discussion we're having in South Africa now on, on the national health insurance uh, uh, plan. Uh, and there is a very vigorous debate happening between the Ministry of Health and, uh, and, and, and the trade unions around the role of the, of the private health sector in helping to realize uh, and rolling out a national health insurance plan. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the unions say no, absolutely not. Mm. Uh, the government takes a, a much more uh, nuanced approach and says, well, actually, some of the challenges we face in the public uh, health sector mean that we can roll out national health insurance. Well, now I'm ad libbing I'm not putting words in our minister's mouth. But you know, we can roll out a health system. But if we exclude the, the sophistication of the private sector in health, we, we probably are, are doing our uh, citizens a, a, a disfavor. And I think that's probably a, a, a dimension that um, uh, sort of uh, nuances that. Um, I just want to say one thing about Agenda 2063, and absolutely uh, your point about it's too far in the future. I certainly won't be around. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, what is it? I think. You know, the, uh, the, the attempt to, to break it down into 10-year implementation plans and create a monitoring framework, an evaluation framework, is, is something different. And I think I'd like to give it a chance. Uh, and what was really heartening was to see at the um, uh, summit in, uh, at the African Union in, in January, the mandating of the African peer review mechanism 
to try to develop a monitoring framework both for the, uh, for the Agenda 2063 as well as for the SDGs. Uh, and so very much, you know, it's front of mind that we have to be able to monitor, we have to evaluate. Of course, the proof is in the eating of the pudding, pudding. but um, um, I think that's important. And the other, the other thing about major infrastructure projects, sorry, I'm <laughs> going to poke you. Uh, major infrastructure projects um, is the challenge is all... a Barbara, no. <laughs> yeah, Is the issue of project preparation and financing project preparation because there are lots of great ideas, but many of those ideas are, are not at any point ready to be financed, whether it's by the private sector or by a combination. One of the things that South Africa has certainly put on its agenda, uh, both in the context of some of the BRICS discussions as well as in, in the region, is creating facilities uh, uh, to, to encourage, uh, to, to help finance the work that needs to go into project preparation. And so to be able to do that properly and, and you know, do the feasibility studies, to be able to then look at how you can finance, uh, finance it, whether you need public-private or it, it is public or, or, or whatever. And I think that's been a... We've seen that in the establishment of the new development bank and the African Regional Center, once that happens, uh, will have that, uh, that dimension. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, ich glaube, dass noch mal deutlich wird. Thank you. I think it has made clear that uh, there is one central threat in our debate. Without transparency, the, uh, the civil society, the parliaments do not stand a chance to get involved. And this brings us to a big issue. What about the uh, transparency of investment plans of G20? I would like to give the floor again to Mr. Schmidt with regard to PPP. And now then I appeal to uh, all of you to make comments or ask questions. And here I would first and foremost focus on our African gas. Well, what has been said about the financing of feasibility studies was taken up by us. We uh, want to create more opportunities to finance feasibility studies. The uh, business sector has always approached us in this respect. As to PPP, my experience says that we have quite a different relationship to our government than in other African uh, countries. So we uh, always uh, have the legal information saying, if we do not agree with what the state does, we can take the following measures. We have parliaments that take the uh, king's right of the parliaments uh, very seriously. They look at the budgets. So uh, in this context, the debate what is public, what is private is quite different from other countries where the state is not present or if the state is present, it always wants something from the citizens, i.e. money. And uh, when you have an approach, I pay something, but I want to get something in return. This is interesting. And some of these things do not fall under PPP, perhaps communities, things that were completely different from what we can imagine. So we need to be more flexible here. And the uh, second question is, do you want to do it quickly from outside? Of course, you can build up a hospital with many uh, doctors, but this is not very sustainable. Or do you want to develop these structures sustainably? And with PPP, it means for me, more to involve the other side. In many systems, the government is not present. It doesn't offer education or schools. And if we get uh, other actors to do a bit more, I think this is positive. 
well, uh, development aid has not yet managed to build up these institutions. Well, whether PPP can do it, I see a lot of need for discussion. And this is what we want to do now. So it's now up to you. I will allow two rounds of questions, perhaps three uh, qu questions per round. Oh, it's you, Julia. You uh, were the first one. Thank you for this round. I have two more general points. First, as to security and uh, what conditions are needed for investments to function. We are talking about a systemic change, very thorough one. And when we look back into history, such a change is hardly peaceful when we take this change seriously. For me, the question is, how can it be designed to be a peaceful change given the urbanization and the growing population? My second point is a question perhaps to Stefan Meyer. Democracy and human rights. I see that democracy is not always useful in discussions when you talk to autocrats. But what I find astonishing is that uh, together with democracy, also human rights are removed. And I think this is the reason for concern. And so my question, if not democracy, it should be at least human rights. My name is Lawi Ejayala, Nigerian Economic Summit Group. And again, I just want to commend the fact that those of you here, the three, the German officials, actually, I didn't see some coordination within the discussion, different perspective. It simply means that the whole idea of the compact is still being cooked. It has not arrived yet. So we're still discussing. And I hope that you'll bear in mind all the things that the African uh, group had raised throughout this meeting. The fact that the needs of every of those countries differ and there should be much more coordination and consultation. And I like when you use the three C's, called coordination, consultation. I had called a very high ranking government official in Nigeria to say, where is Nigeria in all of this? Yes. And they're saying, we don't know anything about it. We are aware of the migration TV plan, but we don't even know this at all. That shows that there's plurality of all this going around. How are we doing coordination? That's one. The second thing which I want to share is the fact that I've heard us talk about the PPP. I want to, I want to understand from the experience of the developed world, to what extent have they used PPP to provide the basic infrastructure for the, the citizenry. Is it because there is their need for infrastructure in Africa? And we're saying, so if we give you some money, you can leverage private capital. How has it worked in the developed world? Mm. And how do you expect it to work in Africa, particularly the third world? Those are the key states. And the third, which is again, which I mean, so I wanted to be able to share that experience with us. And the third, which was shared by, uh, in terms of job creation tax and port reforms. He was not there when it was read yesterday. That what Africa need is how do you help our processing so that you raise more people that are put to work and then you can then expand the tax base and then there'll be public funding to take care of some of these key things that we need to do. The question therefore is that what can and what should Germany do? Because that's the question. And I've said that, to what extent are you addressing? Are you willing 
to address these issues in the light of the things that the African contingent has brought to fall. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is David D from Kenya. I'm curious, and this is the German private sector. I'm curious about why the German private sector thinks it can be competitive in investing in Africa. <laughs> Reason is, where I'm coming from, we buy Chinese or Indian motorcycles for $300. Germany cannot manufacture motorcycles for $300. So on the consumer side of things, I think you're out for the count. Uh, if you think about maybe locating in Africa for exports, uh, we are a high labor cost economies, most of us, uh, by virtue of the fact that that's not our competitive advantage. We cannot become a sweatshop manufacturing Chinese, Asian type Bangladesh places by virtue of the fact that uh, economically, uh, resource rich countries do not uh, sell cheap labor. So as a location for export processing, we are also out for the count. Uh, thirdly, if you look at infrastructure, and German companies have got a lot of very good infrastructure building companies, uh, I don't think there's a German company which can actually win a competitive tender on an infrastructure project on price at the moment. Mm -hmm. Because they just don't do the kind of things I see. Or Turkish companies are doing it. I mean, I know that the Ch Turkish companies are giving Chinese a run for the money on large, like, infrastructure, railway type things. So I'm left wondering, where is the German value proposition for Africa? Because our, our image of German uh, manufacturing is Mercedes Benz. There is okay. no mass market for Mercedes Benz. <laughs> yeah. uh, there they are obviously niches, you know, like uh, chemicals, BASF, I see people like that, uh, servicing the cement companies and stuff like that. But when I hear that German wants to scale up Okay. Uh, and Dave, become a very that. big investor in Africa. Which German companies doing what? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Here is noch eine Frage und there is another question here, and then I'd say no, I can't do a second round um, because Elizabeth has to catch a flight. Uh, uh, those of you who want to uh, uh, request the floor, then they should do that right now, and then we have a con uh, concluding round, and then we have a possibility for informal joint. I study political sciences at the Free University in Berlin. Thanks for this very nice intro, uh, in discussion. What I was lacking here was the question of uh, the effects of climate change. We're sitting here in an industrialized country, and that is maybe a question to you, Mr. Schmidt, the vulnerable state in sub-Saharan uh, Africa, common but shared responsibility context, what could be positions that you take that we haven't discussed so far? Is there no further question? Is there? No? Yes? There is a question. Yeah. Short question and goes to Mr. Schmidt. Uh, it's not a week ago that there was a G7 summit in Sicily. And uh, it was a good sign of uh, Italy to get uh, Africa involved. And I uh, found little coverage about this in, in the media. And I uh, would uh, like to hear whether at the G20 summit there will be a continuation planned and whether that will be on, on eye level or Thanks for these questions. We will start now um, such that Stefan Meyer starts, because many questions were addressed to him, then Mr. Schmidt and Uwe Kickeritz. And the last word is uh, going to be Elizabeth, except mine. I'll have the last, last word. I start with uh, human rights. Uh, they are part of uh, legal certainty, uh, legal security, really. And for many German companies, this is very important. 
and uh, uh, German companies react very sensitively when human rights are violated uh, because it's an indicator for legal uncertainty. We could observe that uh, last uh, months uh, German investment into into Turkey have gone uh, have, have been reduced significantly after what has happened in in, in recent months. There's uh, doubts as to whether uh, that is still the rule of law there. And, uh, and uh, from the point of view of German uh, 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 companies, they feel uh, very comfortable in, in a democracy um, that holds true for other countries. Good governance, democracy, uh, so what's our requirements? Uh, that has been discussed. Now, PPP. I cannot give you a comprehensive answer, but I would like to uh, say the following. We change our perception regarding PPP. We have highly successful PPP. And one of these PPPs is a dual uh, vocational training. It's, it's dual uh, uh, training uh, is funding by the state, uh, uh, the vocational schools, and uh, is uh, private funding uh, by apprenticeship places. Of course, your take would be different. It depends on the terms of reference for PPP. So you can have a very different look at PPP. And from a very abstract level uh, to a very small infrastructure promotion program, that all would be covered by PPP. So I wouldn't discredit the, 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 the PPP, but the terms of reference have to be defined so that PPP is also for the common good. That's a discussion that we have to have, and also competitiveness. German companies will never be able to compete uh, price-wise with the Chinese uh, motorcycle manufacturers. Um, there's uh, little uh, uh, doubt uh, regarding German competitiveness, otherwise we wouldn't have that major uh, uh, um, uh, trade deficits uh, discussions. Uh, it's four industries. It's chemical, um, uh, mechanical engineering, cars, electrical engineering. Uh, that we are very strong. There's two uh, demand areas that we uh, uh, supply, investment goods, that's why we have strong investment also into China. The, the other is high-end consumer goods. For both, uh, the demand in most African countries is very low, clearly. That's why um, this complaint uh, that we are not uh, as active as China is not, not an active complaint and a valid complaint. However, uh, in other areas, competitiveness of Germany would be there. In infrastructure projects, we are at the level of, mm, not at the level of Turkish and Chinese companies, at least uh, regarding that quality level that they provide or that we provide. But if it's beyond price uh, tax, then we could offer a lot. Uh, a strong message of Carlos Lopez yesterday evening was the following. We need, by all means, uh, and it's completely true for Africa, we need manufacturing industry. Would that be a sector where well, German industry would be interested to build uh, production capacities like uh, uh, further processing raw materials or uh, produce? Africa is exporting commodities and has no manufacturing industry. Would that be a sector to invest for German industry? For the industry, it makes no sense to uh, commodities, a uh, bulk, a bulk uh, goods to to uh, transport them and process them in Germany. But uh, yeah, but, but we do this. But let's come back to that investment condition. Is there legal certainty? Are there skilled labor? Can I do this there? And that brings us back to that point. Uh, to come back to the labor. Germany is not competitive uh, uh, on account of low wage costs. So. Uh, uh, the, the wage costs are not a criterion for investment for us. Our competitiveness is somewhere different. 
Mr. Schmidt. Um, the question, is it a complete strategy? Uh, if you have three economists, uh, then you usually have five different opinions. And it is good that we have sometimes different opinions and uh, everybody agreeing would be like North Korea, I think. And so uh, yeah, everybody would say the same thing there. Uh, so it is work in progress. Of course, uh, the foreign ministry has a different view than the finance expert, and that will continue to be different. What is important with regards to compacts is that this is demand oriented. It was an offering going to all American, uh, African nations, and some reacted, some didn't. Then we don't need one size fits all, but rather go there and ask what would work for you. And that's what's currently happening. And I'm uh, excited to learn what's the outcome. And. Uh, and when will you have uh, uh, the compact uh, uh, st land status withdrawn if certain things are not met? I mean, when you uh, sign a contract, then you always have to look at uh, what happens if you don't uh, uh, fulfill the, the, the requirements. I find your question very exciting about PPP and how did it work in Europe. Uh, economic historians don't think in terms of these categories. In this city, there was a lot uh, done that you would now call PPP. It was uh, like uh, private companies uh, uh, building roads, etc., with a lot of um, um, stipulations. If you look at the German small states, and you'd see various different models for the various different uh, segments. So I think the history was very exciting in this regard. And now, the G7. Third question. In the media, there was little talk about African uh, uh, con uh, comedy, uh, uh, involvement and uh, in the communique neither. And, uh, and there was a lot of, uh, of fringe talks. Uh, and I'm still waiting for the outcomes there. Uh, so that's interesting. And the debate is. Um, uh, whether Africa remains on the guest table, whether this is good or not. There will be one meeting in June, a big conference, where Africa will be sent to sit 12th, 13th June, and then the actual summit in, uh, in Hamburg, where the uh, uh, African Union president is uh, uh, invited. This is a small format invitation. And last point, climate change, vulnerable states. Uh, well, we have these adaptation programs where a lot uh, is going on. And in the area of energy supply, lots can be done. We're trying to offer this, yeah. If there's European coordination, no, uh, French have a different uh, energy policy than we have. We are uh, strongly advocating decentralized renewable small scale projects, and not everybody shares that approach. That's what we're trying to offer. In many cases, it's successful, and um, sometimes there's lots of stumbling blocks. So, potential for renewable is huge if you look at hydro, solar, geothermal. But uh, what is even more important is that there is uh, not the impression that everything should be like it is in Germany and everything would be nice and well. Uh, Agenda 2030 was mentioned. It's not enough. We have to say that it is a joint learning uh, curve, and we have to uh, mentally adjust to that. And uh, to tell the other one, this is our joint problem with all the difficulties. And here I still see lots of uh, a mindset problem that many have not internalized that. Ich bin der Meinung, sobald es um Investitionen I think when it comes to investments of whatever kind the Paris Declaration and the SDGs have to be the orientation line. And here a lot needs to be done uh, in the compact. Well, I didn't want to say before that there are no reasonable PPPs, but there have to be very strict 
criteria. You mentioned a few, and the question how PPP have helped development in Germany. I mean, it may be that some roads were built with PPP, but the central things, education, health system was not PPP, and it would not have worked out. If you say PPP as a vocational training program with Siemens, OK. But in this area, no corporation can make any profit. Well, as to competitiveness and the question in how far we can quickly become active at the local level. level. Minister uh, Müller spoke about value chains, but I don't see it. Coffee, we could achieve it immediately. We say raw cafe without tax to Europe and uh, roasted coffee also tax free to Europe. This would be a revolution and this would allow us to build uh, some uh, value chain. Looking at EPAS, the European Partnership Agreement, I think everybody knows what EPA, EPA stands for. One part of the agreement is that raw materials come to Europe tax-free. The African must not impose export taxes. Why? Because we want to get the raw materials cheap. Your ideology uh, saying it's very uh, low price, uh, well, I think politicians know how detrimental such a tax ban is. ECOWAS gets six billion over a period of five years to use this principle. You know uh, how quickly five years are gone by, and I think this cannot work. We could do quite a lot more without starting a revolution. That's a good point, I think, to uh, to pick up. Um, <clears throat> I think you know when we talk about uh, resources for development in Africa and meeting Africa's uh, needs and the role of the private sector, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the role of domestic resource mobilisation. The one thing uh, that uh, is important to seriously engage on at the G20 level is the global rules that, um, you know, the G20 often uh, sits and uh, contemplates and decides on b banking regulation, on rules for the digital economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those have fundamental impact on developing economies and most certainly on, on, on Africa. Um, but we're not at that uh, in those discussions and, in fact, what what we realize, and we, we've seen that also in the context of the of the financial crisis, that trying to tackle problems that emanated from the north by creating gro global rules itself uh, disadvantages and creates constraints on developing economies who face a different set of problems. So a lot of the, and, and we heard a bit about that yesterday as well, uh, a, a lot of the, uh, the the sort of the conditions that were revolved, uh, that were developed, the regulations uh, around the, uh, the financial crisis actually would have dis significantly disadvantaged banks and, and, and financial systems um, in Africa. The same clearly can be said about the global rules of trade. And dare I mention Doha Development Round. Um, we're, of course, I come from a country which is uh, uh, the only region that has actually now implemented and ratified the economic partnership agreements on, uh, uh, on the continent, SADC, or SACU plus uh, Mozambique. Um, but, you know, there are issues that actually constrain countries in Africa and other developing, and the rest of the developing world, uh, and, and we're given development aid to mitigate that. Mm -hmm. You know, if we're serious about this at the G20 level, uh, and, you know, this is also about putting an eye, uh, putting a, an eyeglass on the, on, the, on the G20, those are things that actually developed economies have to take very seriously, illicit financial flows, uh, you know, base erosion and profit shifting. And I just want to make one point here 
around, you know, the whole issue of tax evasion and trade mispricing is very much central to, to the trade debate. Um, uh, you know, it's, it, they, we've seen an increase in trade-based money laundering that emanates from, from some of that. And those are debates we must also have, and those are actually decisions if we really, you know, want to help Africa, you know, we need to be thinking about that superstructure. So that's the one point. Second point, and I'm probably going to miss my flight at this stage. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, regional value chains, I think, are, are very important. And, and what is what is critical here is that certainly in the SADC region, we are discussing uh, the rolling out of an industrialization plan that's linked to, linked to regional value chains. And I think regional markets, you talked about the distance from market. If you're creating regional markets, you're trying to, uh, to address that. Sometimes, though, we forget about the political economy of particular particular types of, uh, of, of engagement. So I heard, in fact, last night about uh, a country that shall remain nameless, an emerging economy, uh, where uh, at the political level they said, actually, let's try to do cashew nut um, beneficiation um, in, in this particular African country. Uh, their mission in another country in West Africa had the ambassador on the phone saying, actually, I've got a whole bunch of Senegalese here who are the middlemen for the cashew industry in this other country who are saying, um, you know, hey, you know, we're out of... Um. So I think these are some of the dimensions that we need to consider or that act as constraints sometimes. Yeah, wunderbar. Um, danke. Great. First, thank you to the panelists. It was a good final debate, and I'm very grateful for the last two statements. We have to think about everything. Uh, last night I said, do no harm would also be a good starting point for a compact with Africa. It was confirmed by uh, you two here, and there are many other issues that play a role in this do no harm approach. I would like to thank everybody who has helped to organize this conference. I think it was very insightful also in the run-up to the uh, big Africa summit uh, with this conference and many information on our website. We uh, made a contribution to a better understanding what this Africa year is all about. How many plans are there? How do these plans come about? What uh, do these plans say? And you can read all this uh, on our website, focus on G20. So I would like to thank our Africa team. You really organized a great conference. When we have an international conference, it's also about language, and we had great interpreters who helped us. Also, a uh, warm thank you to you. Thank you to you in the audience for your patience, your cooperation. And now there is a small reward for you. There are some beverages, perhaps also some food. I don't know. So you can use the room here again for informal discussions. Let me just wish you a nice afternoon. Digest the food you got here, the information, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much, and goodbye. <laughs>